reason YouTube has changed the function, so now it's like vertical instead of horizontal. Apologies for that. Um, anyway, welcome. This is going to be a 45-minute uh, art, theory, literature, philosophy live stream session in which I'm going to try to introduce to you the concept or the idea of the grotesque. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the grotesque and how you might find it in cinema or even in manga or anime. And finally, at the end of the session, I'd like to talk a little bit about how the grotesque factors into the Hegelian concept of the night of the world, which he develops in his Jena Real Philosophie, and how that can help you understand Zizek and Lacan. So that's quite a lot to cover in about 45 minutes, uh, but, but I think we can do it. If you're new here, welcome. This is a weekly live lecture series that I've been hosting for almost three years now, believe it or not. And the goal is basically to instill within you, hopefully, a continued love of learning and just to spread enthusiasm about literature, philosophy, theory, psychoanalysis, cinema, what have you. And I'm so grateful that you're here. Please do drop a comment letting me know where you're joining me from. Always makes me very happy to know that we're connecting from around the world. I am currently in Paris. This is a, an apartment that I've been renting here. I, I love being here. I think it's absolutely wonderful. It's, uh, I, I never really wanna leave, to be honest. Uh, but I'm only gonna be here for another week, and then I'm gonna be heading to Hamburg, Hamburg, Germany. Um, however, please do drop a comment, let me know where you're joining me from. I see Singapore, I see Seoul, Seoul. I see Paris as well, hello, bonjour. Uh, I see India, hello India, Boston, Florida, hello Jason from Florida, Germany, New York, <laughs> Pakistan, it's incredible. Thank you so much, brings me a lot of joy. And as always, if you'd like to become a patron and join our learning community behind the scenes, you can go to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. And if you're just getting into Hegel, I've recently posted a Hegel, uh, intro to Hegel ebook to my Patreon that you can find there. But okay, let's begin. Um, today I would like to talk about the grotesque, specifically because I think it was two weeks ago that I was talking about the theater of the absurd. And the idea of the grotesque and the, the theater of the grotesque is one of the precursors to the theater of the absurd. Now, when I refer to the theater of the grotesque, it's an Italian theatrical modernist movement from the early 20th century that essentially combines certain elements in their theatrical productions that would also be a key part of Freud's theory of the uncanny, like uh, the mirror syndrome. And uh, for, for, for the... Uh, for the grotesque theater, it's also the process of the encounter with oneself as a puppet, which then would re later be re rediscovered as the idea of an encounter with the real, etc. Uh, but I actually want to go way back to begin. In fact, if we look at the etymology of the word grotesque, it actually comes from the word grotto. And the, the, the artistic idea or concept of the grotesque goes back to some of the early paintings and murals that we found within grottos in Italy. In fact, this type of decorative, uh, if you will, iron, uh, what would then become decorative mural work and iron work is something that we see throughout both the Baroque and the Renaissance, but going all the way back to certain Roman frescoes. And one of the key characteristics of these motifs is that they blend floral motifs with fauna so that we have animals and we have uh, 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 essentially vegetation, and it creates this dense, twisting, almost like a vine motif that was referred to as the grotesque as early as like the 15th century. However, there's nothing distinctly grotesque in a modern sense about this, but here we have one of the beginnings of the first idea of the grotesque, which is a blending or a blurring of the lines between the animal kingdom and the kingdom of nature between the animal, animalistic features, the human features, and the natural categories. In fact, one of the key aspects of the grotesque is this blurring of the lines, a certain doubling of what would otherwise be quote-unquote uncanny or slightly strange features. And then the grotesque for a long time essentially becomes a decorative artistic motif, even in the Middle Ages. Like, in the Middle Ages, if you, if you go to any a gothic cathedral, you will see these water spewers, these water figures that are grimacing and water comes out of them, or gargoyles, of course, 
which is another decorative feature that we associate with the grotesque. It's simply a, a, a more extreme version of what we already saw in the Roman Empire. In fact, um, in, in um, Belgium, of course, one of the key features of the grotesque is the idea of the Monica Piss, the little boy who's peeing into the fountain. And, but if you go back to the Middle Ages, you'll find lots of seemingly humorous, satirical sculptures, gargoyles, that have similar ideas. For example, there's actually a great, if you go to Freiburg in, in, in Germany, in the southwest of Germany, there's a wonderful uh, Brunnen, there's a, a wonderful little fountain that consists of different figures who are all pulling up their skirts or unzipping their pants and essentially peeing into the fountain. This satirical element is also part of the grotesque. And, and the reason I'm mentioning this is that one of the key aspects of the grotesque is that it's never simply horrific. It's always meant to also be comedic or satirical. In fact, the German author Thomas Mann, much, much later, early 20th century, would write that the grotesque remained the key stylistic feature by which to undermine the bourgeoisie. In other words, there's something indecent, something grotesque, something not mannered, distinctly not Victorian, not moralistic about the grotesque that could be used as a form of comedy or satire to undermine or at least critique the existing orders and the order and the powers that be. And so within the grotesque, there's not only that uncanny element, there's also always that rebellious nature. Now, one of my favorite examples of, of the grotesque from a contemporary perspective will be familiar to you if you're interested in manga or anime. If you've read One Piece or watched the One Piece anime, then you know exactly what the grotesque is because practically every villain in the One Piece canon is a contemporary Japanese version of a figure of the grotesque. In fact, this is where um, the, the art really draws upon certain grotesque Western features. Think about um, one of the first villains who was encountered is the, uh, the, the clown, I forget what his name is, Buggy or something like this. Then we have the crocodile. Uh, one of my favorites is the one who looks like a ballerina. There are all these amazingly imaginative, grotesque characters that we find in the One Piece anime and manga. And, and to my mind, it's such a perfect illustration of the grotesque in contemporary terms because none of them are outright horrific all of them exist in a kind of dark blend of satire versus something that is uncanny, that blurs the lines between animal and human, between man and woman. In fact, you could argue that what One Piece accomplishes so well is that it essentially posits that to be a pirate is to embrace the grotesque, to live a life that is not bourgeois, to live a life that is free, in which you can sail the seas and live in a way where you embrace discovery and not everything has to be categorized. In fact, one of the beautiful messages of One Piece throughout the storylines is that things aren't always what they appear to be at first sight. That, to take the classic aphorism, you can't judge a book by its cover. And the covers of all the characters that we meet are distinctly grotesque within the One Piece universe. Of course, even the idea of the demon fruit and the powers that it lends you is another form of the grotesque. The idea that Luffy can stretch his arms out is a version of the grotesque. It's both comedic and somewhat unsettling at the same time. And one of the central messages of One Piece is that to be a pirate is to be free, to be free to live however you want to live. And this is one of the central principles of the grotesque, that the grotesque is about living outside the perceived norms of what it means to live and a good, structured, moralistic life. Once again, there's always something inherently rebellious or even revolutionary to the idea of the grotesque. And here you can actually see one of the differences, to my mind, between the grotesque and the absurd, where the absurd essentially juxtaposes an almost nihilistic lack of meaning with the immense overarching meta-narratives of ideology that emerge after World War II. In other words, we have massive constructions of ideological purpose that are confronted with the increased alienation and meaninglessness of individual life as such. The search for purpose, therefore being one of the aspects of the absurd, always reveals nothing, that there is no purpose. Perhaps the only purpose is this absence of purpose. Whereas within the grotesque, we have something a little bit more joyful, something that embraces 
the weird, the strange, the unclassifiable, and therefore there's something very liberating about the idea of the grotesque. In fact, when people talk about the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages, it's sometimes a slightly, to my mind, unnecessary pejorative way of looking at that era because the Middle Ages aren't really dark. They're full of these strange, unclassifiable, comedic, macabre, grotesque figures and ideas that emerge over and over again. Um, another example of the grotesque that I came across recently, I was watching a wonderful new animated series on Netflix. I think it's called Blue-Eyed Samurai, is that it? Blue-Eyed Samurai. And in Blue-Eyed Samurai, we have one of the most perfect illustrations of the grotesque because one of the key aspects of the grotesque is that it is something that is unclassifiable and hence shameful. Something that exists as a kind of error, as a mistake. And of course, deformity therefore becomes one of the aspects of the grotesque. And in Blue-Eyed Samurai, if I'm getting the title correctly, this is exactly what we have. We have a samurai who is a quote-unquote half-breed who is not simply Japanese but half-white. And that, I'm not going to give away the gender of the character, but of course the un, un, unde, indefinable quality of the character's gen, genre, uh, gender mixed with the blue eyes that are therefore distinctly not Japanese is a beautiful illustration of the idea of the grotesque. In fact, this character is often referred to as a monster, as an abomination, as, 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 as something that is shameful. And the arc of the character is precisely to redeem this existence, this grotesque existence, as having value. And of course, throughout the story, this blue-eyed samurai then attracts and encounters other people who are looking for meaning, who don't necessarily fit within the given social system. For example, the blue samurai's sidekick is a young man who is disabled, who does not have hands. And it's beautifully animated how he navigates his way through the world, eating noodles, etc., without hands. There's something darkly comedic about this bumbling disabled person, and yet it's never ableist. It's always deeply empowering. It's about how someone who faces immense challenges, who is seen as a freak, is nevertheless finding his way and his purpose in life. In fact, at a certain point, I think it's like episode three, he says, at a certain point in my life, I realized that I could not be great, but that I could assist greatness. And that perhaps this is what his version of greatness is. It is being an assistant to that which he perceives to be great. This search for purpose, this realization that you don't have to be like everybody else, that perhaps the things that mark you out as being strange or weird or that make you don't fit in, that this is precisely what makes you quote unquote special, this is a characteristic of the grotesque. In fact, one might go as far, and I'll return to this later in the lecture, one might go as far as saying that the grotesque is simply another word for subjectivity as such, for the messy, chaotic reality of what it means to be a subject. Now, I want to go back in time. We've talked about One Piece and the Blue-Eyed Samurai. But one of the instances in which we can see the grotesque emerging most clearly is actually in Gogol's short story writing. Nikolai Gogol uh, is a 19th century uh, author. I say author because he is of Ukrainian origin. However, at the time, Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire and he wrote in Russian. Hence, his writing has become part of the Russian canon and his works were deeply influential for, for example, Dostoevsky. However, considering recent geopolitical turmoil, the question as to Gogol's nationality and his importance as part of a contributor to a national identity or national literature has once again become deeply polemical and controversial. So let's call Nikolai Gogol an author at present, an author of Ukrainian origin. And Nikolai Gogol, started using a stylistic technique in his short story writing, for example, in The Overcoat, or in The Nose, or in his longer work, Dead Souls, where we have the introduction of a new element to the grotesque, which is tragic comic. And this is really key. It's no longer simply strange or absurd. It is also tragic. We have here the introduction, if you will, of a certain type of psychological realize, realism in Gogol's writing that would become hugely influential. For example, it's impossible to think of 
Dostoevsky's story um, about the double, which I can explain in a moment, the double without Gogol's overcoat. And to my mind, it's impossible to think about Kafka's um, metamorphosis in which young Gregor Samsa wakes up to find himself as an ungezifa, as an undefinable uh, uh, vermin, essentially. It's impossible to think about these works existing without the contribution of Gogol to the literary canon through the means of the grotesque. In fact, Gogol is the master of the grotesque. I'll give you an example. In the nose, in the nose, which is there's also a beautiful uh, opera production uh, of, of the nose, which you might enjoy. Uh, a couple of years ago, to go on a side tangent here, a couple of years ago, I was in London and I went to see a production of the nose, um, which uses Schoenberg's atonal music. So it's a quite challenging piece of opera, and yet it's a tragic comic. Um, in, in in which a young functionary wakes up one day to find that his nose has gone missing. And he sort of goes on this slightly delirious quest to try to find his nose. He's now a deformed man. And there's a deeply surreal sequence halfway through the opera in which tap dancers appear in giant nose costumes, like 12 of them, and they start dancing like a tap dance on stage. And then at the end of the dance, one of the noses stepped up front and yelled out into the auditorium, thank you, London. And this is this is like my recollection of Gogol's The Nose. I, I can't talk about Gogol with thinking about these giant noses that, that that came onto stage at the Royal Opera House in London, which which is not the kind of thing you'd usually see at the ROH, uh, it being a slightly more formal uh, occasion usually. Um, in fact, if you're into like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it, you know that in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, we have the, the cult that worships the cosmic sneeze. This is, again, something that feels very grotesque. It feels very much like a goal. In fact, if you look at the comedy in Monty Python, Monty Python is full of references or allusions to the grotesque. There's a beautiful scene, uh, I forget what the movie is, it's the one that has all the sketches, uh, where there's a, a grotesquely uh, obese man in a restaurant who begins eating everything in the restaurant and finally he eats one morsel of food too many and he explodes. And this combination of body horror with a certain tragic comic quality is, is a beautiful contemporary rendition of the absurd that to my mind wouldn't be possible without Gagol. In fact, body horror and kind of the idea of ghostly apparitions runs throughout Gagol's work. It's not just the loss of the nose. For example, in The Overcoat, which is a beautiful short story by Gogol, we have a young man, or actually he's not so young, a man who's working at an unknown or unnamed department within the St. Petersburg bureaucracy. And he's so committed to copying out work, he's a copyist, that he doesn't take care of himself. All of his clothes are faded, his overcoat is falling apart at the seams. And one day, whilst walking home, it begins to snow and he realizes that he needs a new overcoat. And this realization, this minimal assertion of individuality, of subjectivity, in other words, the choice of what coat to buy, sets off an enormous se sequence of unexpected and cataclysmic events that end up tearing this young man apart. In fact, once he buys a new overcoat, his superiors decide to uh, uh, host a party for the overcoat, an ironic, almost pitying gesture of this man's inferiority. And he has to walk all the way across St. Petersburg to go to this fancy apartment where they're supposed to celebrate his coat, but actually they just want to get drunk. He then leaves, and on his way home, he's robbed by three men who take his overcoat. Then he walks home shivering, develops a fever. The following day, he's at death's door, and within the week, he has perished. Nobody at his job even notices. After all, he's simply a lowly copyist. Here we have... Gogol's grotesque, but it only becomes truly grotesque in the last part of the story. Because the last part of the story is that suddenly, after this young man's death, people start losing their overcoats. Not only do they lose them, but they are beset by what appear to be zombie-like apparitions who, at the dead of night, besiege them in the dark and tear away their overcoats. And the police are so scared that they don't know what to do. They are being haunted by a host of undead overcoat robbing apparitions. This introduction of a magical, realist, almost comedically absurd horror element is distinctly Gagol. There's a great short story by Gagol which 
uh, hilariously was inter was was collected in a, in a short in, in a collection of Christmas short stories that I bought a while ago, where a young man uh, celebrates Christmas alone in his Dhaka and uh, is besieged by the undead and by ghosts who come knocking at his door, and. We can see this, of course, even uh, uh, within Dickens. Dickens has elements of the absurd when it comes to Scrooge, who has shown all of his alternate lives, etc. Even within Romanticism, Goethe's Faust and Faust's Dream, in which Mephistopheles shows him Walpurgis Nacht celebrations of scantily clad witches going to the Sabbath is a distinctly grotesque image. And what makes it romantic is that one of the key characteristics of German Romanticism was that it preoccupied itself with this idea of absolute knowledge, knowing and understanding everything, art, science, life, the universe. And the question was, at what price do we acquire this knowledge? What does it do to our souls if we want to know everything? Hence, Faust is given, Faust is a young scholar, He's given, he's a young romantic scholar, he's given the opportunity by Mephistopheles to have unlimited knowledge and power in and of the universe, and yet at the price of selling his soul. And this, again, is an image of the grotesque. It's a, something that, that becomes so important to the development of 18th and 19th century literature. Another story by Gogol, it's called Dead Souls. Absolutely love it. In, in the central premise uh, can, be, can be told quite simply. It's, it's, it's very critical also of, of the Russian feudal system. Uh, in Dead Souls, we have a young man who wants to give the appearance of being wealthy. And the way in which he does that is he exploits a loophole in the Russian feudal system, which is that the lords, the, the owners of land, have to pay a certain tax on their serfs. And so if they own, quote unquote, serfs, essentially like a slave class who work the land, they have to pay taxes for them. However, if one of their serfs dies, they still have to pay taxes on the dead serf, at least until a certain amount of time has expired. And so what this young, upwardsly, mobile, aspirational man decides to do is that he goes across Russia, finding these lords, and he offers to buy they're dead serfs. In other words, he essentially says, I will pay the remaining debt for your deceased serf as long as you then put the name of the serf as being mine. And so he acquires the, the, um, the image of wealth, the image of being a land-holding person who has serfs, and yet it's all on paper. It's distinctly abstract. His wealth doesn't really exist except he's bought the rights to all of these dead serfs, these dead peasants. And of course, here again, we have the grotesque in, in its most complex form. We have the, the existence of an uncanny uh, uh, list that contains workers that don't really exist, who no longer live. We have the doubling, the illusion of the rich man who's pretending to be rich without actually having the means to be so, uh, at least enough to buy the debt, but that's about it. And then finally, we have the quote-unquote satirical, critical element that it's mocking, it's making fun of the inequality of the Russian social system, but more importantly, not just the inequality, but the very vanity fair, the theater of social, of the social display of wealth that comes with it. And today, sometimes we, I, I, I read an article that reminded me of this recently, um, and it was about fakes, so not fake serfs, not dead souls, but fake handbags. In fact, one of the greatest objects of luxury today, luxury good products, uh, what are, are, are luxury bags, handbags, and Louis Vuitton carry bags. Like, I saw that Pharrell Williams has supposedly the million dollar Louis Vuitton bag that there's only like one of, etc. And And these are insanely expensive things. However, as is true with most luxury products, they can also be faked. They can be... Uh, uh, there can be replicas that are created. And one of the grotesque aspects of this is that often the fakes have components that come from the very same factories that make the authentic ones. It's just that certain like handles, etc., of the bags will be stolen from the factories and then repurposed for the fakes and sold for 10 or 100 times less on the black market. And what's interesting about this is that what the companies fear, like what Louis Vuitton and Chanel, etc., what they fear is not that people start carrying around fakes. This is almost inevitable. Of course, they work together with authorities to try to prevent it, but it's inevitable. 
What they really fear is that it will become cool to have a fake. In other words, think about it. Usually if you have a fake handbag or a fake watch or something like this, the whole point is that you want it to look like a luxury item. You don't want people to be able to tell that it's fake. You want to have the appearance of having so much disposable income that you too are living a gilded, gilded life in which you can carry expensive luxury goods. And yet the companies don't really mind that because it still serves to uphold the idea of their brand. What they're really afraid of is the idea that one day everybody flaunts having a fake, that having a fake becomes cool. In fact, on TikTok, there was a trend where people started talking about their fake handbags and they weren't trying to hide it. They were proud of it. They were calling it, quote unquote, frugal flexing. Namely, why would I spend $3,000 on a handbag if I could get a perfectly good fake for $300? And this is what the companies fear. What the companies fear is not that you're gonna have a fake. What they fear is that you don't mind having a fake, that having the fake becomes cool and that suddenly it seems ludicrous to spend that much money on a luxury item. Remember, the whole point of a luxury product is not necessarily that it costs that much money to make. The whole point is that you want to signal wealth, often ludicrous amounts of wealth, to other people. Hence, it's not only a private pleasure, although certainly it can be. You can have a beautiful luxury watch or like a nice coat or something. I'm not against this. I'm not against luxury goods. The point, however, is that the companies want to protect this idea that exclusivity is cool. And as soon as frugal flexing becomes cool, that's when the fakes become a threat. And I was reading an article by a German journalist in the Zeit who had gone to great lengths to try to acquire a fake Louis Vuitton handbag. And he was talking to a woman who was the middleman, she calls herself the teacher, who would essentially hook people up with uh, merchants in China who would make really convincing knockoffs. And there's a wonderful little anecdote where at a certain point she had ordered a bag from China and it didn't arrive. Instead, she got a letter from the German customs police. And the letter said, we suspect that there is fraud. And so we've sent the bag to the actual manufacturer, Louis Vuitton, to see whether or not this is a real bag. And lo and behold, instead of being fined, she got a letter from Louis Vuitton saying, yes, this is one of our bags. This is how good some of the fakes are, that they are, strictly speaking, indistinguishable from the real thing. And of course, here we have the grotesque, right? We have the grotesque image of a true and a fake bag whose primary difference lies in whether or not they signify authentic wealth or fake wealth. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't fakes that aren't terrible. Clearly, there are some fakes that are of inferior quality, that look terrible, etc. But there's an element of the grotesque whenever we have this doubling, this mirroring, this vanity of social affairs that can so easily be undermined. In fact, to put it in psychoanalytic terms, we have here an encounter with the real. Um, in, for example, imagine that you, there's a, there's a great little, I'm going a little bit fast here, sorry. There's a great ballet that I saw last week. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a ballet from a contemporary uh, of, of early 20th century American ballet. Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember what was the name. I can't remember, I'll look it up. I posted a video of it recently. It's a comedic ballet that incorporates elements of the grotesque. And there's a brilliant part of the ballet where a woman is depressed. It's a little bit misogynistic, but it's also of its age. A woman is depressed, and so a hat maker presents her with a hat, and she puts on the hat, and she doesn't like it. So he gives her another hat, she puts it on, she doesn't like it. Finally, he brings her another hat that she loves and she puts it on her head. She feels like a million bucks. She goes outside and begins beautifully to grace, gracefully walk around, enjoying being seen wearing this beautiful hat until she encounters in the street another woman wearing an identical hat, also walking like this. At that point, her glee, her sense of individual self-worth disappears and she becomes once again depressed. Now. Apart from the slightly misogynistic element of women who are depressed if they don't have nice hats, etc., women don't like wearing the same thing, there is here another element of the grotesque. It's the doubling, it's the mirroring, it's the slightly tragic, pathos-laden, satirical element of Vanity Fair, of the woman who thinks that she's so special wearing this luxury product, only to realize that all the other women think, women think they're special as well because they're wearing the exact same thing. And of course, within the contemporary economy of 
uh, con constant consumption, we have the same principle. The principle being that we're told to be ourselves, to be authentic individuals, to express ourselves. And yet, fundamentally, the, the most conformist attitude today is to express yourself. The most common thing to do today is to get a tattoo or a piercing, etc., to express your individuality. Once again, I'm not a conservative grump who's against tattoos or piercings, and I'm not saying that they can't be individualistic or meaningful, but fundamentally here we have an element of the grotesque, namely how the very desire to be an individual is the most common experience which further fuels the idea of the market economy. To go back to the grotesque, we have the introduction of a certain mirroring, a certain doubling, a certain uncanny resemblance between people and things and animals and, and plants. We have an introduction of pathos and satire and tragic comedy, and, as Thomas Mann wrote, the undermining of a certain bourgeois self-certainty. Now, Dostoevsky, there's a quote that's attributed to Dostoevsky that's actually not by him, very grotesque, I know, it's by a contemporary of his, a Russian art critic who nobody knows his name, um, but this is this quote that is attributed to Dostoevsky is that he and all the other Russian authors came out from Gogol's overcoat. In fact, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that, because if you read Dostoevsky's The Double, we have a continuation of Gogol's tragicomic grotesque. It's about a, about a man who's working as a young functionary again, and one day he encounters his double, and he sees a double in the street, and it creates a kind of uh, uh, uncomfortable, uh, almost horrific experience for this man, because he doesn't know how to act. Does he bow? Does he say hello? How do you talk to yourself if you are confronted with yourself in the street? It's scary. It's one of the features of the Freudian uncanny, the idea of the doppelganger. And he finds this double, and he doesn't know what to do. He essentially has the beginnings of a nervous breakdown, and throughout the next days, he starts seeing more and more duplicates of himself, more and more copies of copies, like Agent Smith, reproducing themselves. And we have here almost an image from, like, um, Night of the Body Snatchers, where he goes out into public and suddenly he's surrounded by, by what appear to be ordinary people looking at him and screaming at him, and he has a fully-fledged neurotic breakdown, nervous breakdown, and is sent to an insane, an insane asylum. Here we have a more dark, a more extreme version of the grotesque that nevertheless contains all the elements that Gokol himself also introduced. And if you will, this is also Freud's theory of the uncanny. Freud's theory of the uncanny, by definition, is how that which appears to us as ordinary suddenly reveals itself to be deeply strange. In other words, as Freud puts it, that which appears to be real suddenly reveals itself as being imaginary. And here's the key thing. Strictly speaking, everything that exists, everything that is real, still has to be infused with subjective meaning, subjective interpretation. In other words, everything that you do to exist as a person in society, the clothes you wear, the way you speak, how you have your hair, your, your mannerisms, the creation of yourself as a subject is real and it is in concrete material ways attached to your well-being and your chances of success in life, and yet fundamentally it is one big theater, it's a masquerade that everybody participates in. In fact, the grotesque realization is that there is no real you underneath this mask, that you are your own mask, as Lacan would later write in his own theory of subjectivity. In fact, that the mask contains your truth. And this is, of course, a reflection of the grotesque, because remember, if we go all the way back to the beginnings of the grotesque within Roman architecture, we can actually see that the mask is one of the key features of the grotesque. Grimacing, smiling masks. Sometimes we have masks where one side is smiling and the other side is grimacing. This reflection of the subject who recognizes himself by being mirrored in the eyes of the other is therefore the gaze of the grotesque. And the gaze of the grotesque, the gaze of the grotesque is what Sartre once described as hell is other people. Namely, not the realization that it's unpleasant to be with others, but that you yourself are the ultimate other. That it's like that Magritte painting, the Magritte painting of the young man, it's called not to be reproduced, of a young man looking into the mirror and all that he sees back at him is not his face, but the back of his own head. It's a deeply troubling image. In fact, there's a beautiful reference to this Magritte painting, uh, René Magritte, the, 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 Fre uh, the Belgian surrealist. Uh, there's a beautiful reference to this in uh, um, 
the horror movie Us, which was the movie that came up out after uh, Jordan Peele's Get Out. Us, in which we have a painting in the background that seems to have Magritte-esque features. And this concept of the confrontation with yourself as an object of the gaze and creating yourself so as to present yourself to the gaze of the other, thereby having made yourself an object of your very own gaze reflected back to yourself through the anticipated gaze of the other, that is the grotesque. That is the gaze of the grotesque. And perhaps the most interesting and dark and philosophically rich conception of this gaze of the grotesque can be found in Hegel's concept of the night of the world. The night of the world is a passage, and this is pre-phenomenology of spirit. So this is Hegel's Diana Real Philosophie. It's a beautiful, almost gothic, absurd passage in which Hegel writes about a night of the world, a kind of ultimate abstraction in which severed and bloody heads fly around in the dark. And that everyone, you included, can witness the night of the world if you look into your own eyes, namely that if you look into the reflection of your own eyes and you gaze deeply enough, you fall into the abyss of pure self-relating negativity, of pure abstraction, of the void from which the subject has to produce himself. In fact, this is similar to Nietzsche's more poetic expression that if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss might gaze back at you. And this night of the world for Hegel is not a romantic image, it's an image of the grotesque. It's essentially a grotesque image of pure abstraction, of pure possibility from which the subject crawls or emanates. And in this, Hegel was reacting to some of the most idealistic tendencies within German Romanticism, specifically like the Fichtian ich philosophie the, the idealization of subjectivity, the self-positing subject who creates his own reality, which itself was a reaction to the Kantian Kritik der reinen Vernunft, the Critique of Pure Reason, which posited that the subject could not know essence. And Hegel responded to this by creating the idea of subjectivity that does not stand on its own grounding, that does not exist in any kind of a priori absolute sense, but a subjectivity that emerges precisely out of this void of the empty self-positing self subject. In other words, Hegel actually absolutized this by arguing that it was nature that posited this emptiness through which man's reflection came back as nature's own reflection unto itself, which is a very abstract idea, but it's essentially building upon an Aristotelian notion. Aristotle has this idea, I've mentioned it before, of the political animal, where Aristotle basically says that what, distingu what distinguishes mankind from the animal realm is that man is not by definition in his natural element when he exists in nature. In fact, that man, in order to be properly man, has to exit nature, has to join into human relations and community and therefore create what it means to be a subject. A subject who is, for example, part of a family or part of a tribe, part of a religious congregation. That these socio-symbolic relations that are therefore not natural, that are symbolically structured through interrelation with others, are therefore man's natural role in life. Hence why man is the grotesque, not a term which Aristotle uses, man is the grotesque creature of his own unnatural natural tendencies. And Hegel almost takes this idea of man as a political animal, Aristotle's idea, and applies it to the notion of subjectivity as such. That subjectivity isn't the ideal outcome of man's natural purpose, the classic platonic image that man has to live in accordance with virtue because this is in living in accordance with what the gods want. Instead, man is an almost, uh, uh, let's say, impossible, uncharacteristically chaotic, sludge-like, if you want to use this image, emanation, an excess, something that cannot be reconciled with itself or with others, something that exists only as the negation of the impossibility of the resolution or the reconciliation of the absolute with itself. Therefore, that man is the unnatural. Man is the grotesque. Man is the chaotic substance of the grotesque that emerges within what he calls the night of the world, self-relating or self-relating negativity. That therefore man and subjectivity is an excessive third feature that emerges through this irreconcilable, indivisible remainder of the absolute with itself. And 
This is an idea that becomes super important for Slavoj Žižek. Slavoj Žižek, in his interpretation of Hegel, keeps on returning to this night of the world passage in the Jena Real philosophy, because of course, when Hegel writes about this night of the world with the absolute blackness in which severed heads float, and, and if you look into your own eye, you have a breakdown of reality through which the truth of subjectivity emerges, etc. Here we have essentially a psychoanalytic expression of all the lettres. Zizek then takes Lacanian psychoanalysis and the idea of the encounter with the real and applies it to the night of the world. That the truth of subjectivity is therefore that the subject creates his socio-symbolic relations so as not to be confronted with the traumatic kernel of the real. Here we have Lacan's distinction, his famous tri or triad between the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. The imaginary is that we believe that what exists, I'm simplifying here, but the imaginary is our imaginary relationship that what exists in our surroundings is real, that it is true material, that it has to be that way. The symbolic is what upholds the necessity of these appearances as truth, these imaginations. And then the real is the kernel, the traumatic kernel that runs throughout these, that none of this is real, that we nevertheless have to uphold its reality so that we do not lose ourselves. In fact, for Lacan, the fundamental fantasy is precisely this idea of an a priori, true, authentic self, a true self that exists underneath your mask. Hence, when, while, when Lacan argues that you are your own mask, he's making a metaphysical argument that the mask, which within the pl platonic metaphysic, going back to the allegory of the cave, namely we have the illusions in the cave and the truth outside the cave, that the mask, which appears to be the illusionary nature, is not the barrier towards the authentic truth. Therefore, that the face underneath the mask does not exist, that the mask itself creates the illusion of there being an authentic core underneath. Therefore, the ultimate illusion is the idea of an authentic subjectivity that exists underneath the mask. And when Lacan says that you are your mask, he's therefore not only saying that the mask contains your truth, but that the truth is precisely that of the content hidden in the form between the supposed idealized content of the authentic self and the mask that is supposed to be the barrier juxtaposed onto it, which is a metaphysical argument about the allegory of the cave, that it's no longer the metaphysical binary in which you have essence that lies outside the cave and illusions within the cave, and that therefore the project of philosophy is to exit the cave to then gaze into the sun of truth, but that precisely the idea of essence is itself an illusion. In fact, Zizek's problematization of the allegory of the cave is essentially to suggest what if the ultimate illusion projected onto the walls of the cave is precisely this idea of having already exited the cave and being the chosen anointed one who then goes back into the cave to rescue everybody else. Here we have again the grotesque. What could be more grotesque than a mask with nothing underneath? A mask that exists on a pure void, a void of self-relating negativity through which and out of which the idea of subjectivity as its own impossible indivisible remainder emerges. That is the grotesque. And here we can understand the linkage that emerges between the grotesque as an aesthetic principle with an early uh, Roman art that is then rediscovered within the Baroque, within the Renaissance, that then is universalized into opera and literature in the 18th and 19th centuries, but is also a key aspect of change and revolution, not revolution in those terms, but like um, um, rebellion within the Middle Ages, and then all of that comes together into German Romanticism and Hegel's response to the idealization of subjectivity in the German Romantics. Hegel's positing of the night of the world as a distinctly grotesque characterization of the subject, which is almost an allegory, therefore, of his metaphysical system, which would upend the rigid binary of the Kantian critique of pure reason, which itself was meant to uphold the binary of the Platonic metaphysical system. And from Hegel and his post-metaphysical term, which then would later come out of this insight, we have the positing of Freudian theories of the unconscious, psychoanalysis, the introduction of modernism, uh, whether it's an art or architecture, postmodernism, etc. The grotesque comes back. The grotesque is here to stay. As Thomas Mann said, the grotesque becomes the aesthetic category through which the bourgeoisie can be undermined. In fact, Thomas Mann in his own novels uses the grotesque over and over. One of the key differences, if you read, for example, Thomas Mann's first work, Buddenbrooks, and you contrast it with his later post-war work of The Magic Mountain, Der Zauberberg, you can see how Buddenbrooks contains allusions 
to the idea of the grotesque, but never goes full grotesque. It remains a realist novel. Only in The Magic Mountain do we have the full-blown emergence of the grotesque. The character dreams about sleighs containing corpses going down the hill. We have a character who has a slit in his throat out of which he can whistle. We have a woman who walks around having lost both of her sons to tuberculosis who keeps on saying, tous les deux, tous les deux. The introduction of the grotesque occurs not by accident in The Magic Mountain. It occurs because of the certainties that Thomas Mann himself has lost about the potential of art and aesthetics after, world, after the World War. Hence why the grotesque is here to stay. The grotesque exists in the theater of the absurd. The grotesque exists within the theater of the oppressed, Auguste Boal. It exists within anything that seeks to undermine the existing certainties of the status quo and the powers that be. In fact, the critique of ideology is therefore also the critique of the grotesque. The grotesque that lies all around us, how things that we take for granted as supposedly normal are in themselves deeply grotesque. Plastic surgery, grotesque. Luxury handbags, grotesque. The way in which we think that what matters more is the views we get on Instagram, whether, or, or the people we see in our own lives, grotesque. Not in a normative sense. I'm not saying this is bad, it's grotesque. That itself would be bourgeois to, to try to create this taxonomy of good behavior and bad behavior. But the grotesque is that which undermines the certainty of the powers that be. It undermines the perceived order and the innate natural quality of life as such. The grotesque constantly points us toward the real, like a compass that's sw swerving, like in Pirates of the Caribbean. And so whether it's finding it with an anime, like One Piece, beautiful rendition of the grotesque and the villain characters, whether it's in a contemporary Netflix animated show like The Blue Samurai, whether it's in horror movies like Alien, where the grotesque literally comes forth through your stomach, the grotesque is that which is here to undermine our certainties and therefore to provide us with the possibility of artistic and aesthetic renewal and liberation. And therefore, the grotesque is one of the key aspects of human thought. That has been my argument, at least. Thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate that you've joined me here on Instagram and YouTube. If you'd like to download my lectures and download my ebook and be part of our learning community, please consider becoming a patron. You can go to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. Until then, thank you for joining me. I will see you next week.